This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices Episode 70 was recorded on July 6, 2017. I'm Eric Townsend. Tian Yang will be joining me as this week's future interview guest. Tian heads up the research department at Variant Perception. Regular listeners may remember my interview with Variant Perception's founder, Jonathan Tepper, back in March. Tian will be bringing us up to date on Variant's market views and explaining why they don't think that it's time to be short equity markets yet, but they definitely see things starting to roll over. You're definitely going to want to download the chart book that Tian sent us. Registered users will find the download link in your research roundup email, and if you haven't registered yet, you can find instructions on how to register and get the download next to Tian's picture on our homepage at macrovoices.com. But wait, there's more. After the feature interview, we're going to bring you a second guest to continue our expanded coverage of the crude oil market. Samir Madani is the founder of Hashtag OOTT and TankerTrackers.com. Sam and I will discuss the crude oil market, including today's massive drawdown in crude oil inventory levels and the interesting responses that we've seen in terms of market action, which has been a real roller coaster today on Thursday. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, that S&P 500 has now spent an entire week in a distribution cycle. Not only have we seen heightened volatility last week with these big, massive 30-point swings higher and lower in the S&P, but th- today we're f- seeing uh, the market just kind of almost bleeding out. Uh, de- we're right now trading around the 2413 at the time of recording. What's your thinking on the S&P 500? Well, we're still above the 50-day moving average at 24.11, but just barely above it by a couple of ticks, and we've tested it a couple times today. I think that the market is finding a little bit of support there. It doesn't look like it's going to hold, and I would predict that if we break below 24.10, it'll probably accelerate to the downside. Now, the question is, is this just a little blip? Is this just a a little buy-the-dip opportunity, or has the tide actually changed? As you know, and as I've said many times in this program, this market it is way above its proper value in terms of any fundamental measure. But proper valuation is not what's important. What's important is the market can continue to get more and more overvalued until liquidity dries up, until there's no source of more buyers to keep overpaying too much for those S&P shares. Are we there yet? Tian is going to have a lot more to say on it because Variant does a huge amount of work with global liquidity analysis. Uh, so we'll get to that in the feature interview. Seasonally speaking, still a little bit early for, you know, you would you would expect if we were going to have a really big crash this year that we would see the highs in August and things would start to really get shaky in September and then uh, October would be when all the big action is. Certainly doesn't have to go that way. Could happen early. Maybe it's starting early. I'm not sure, but uh, certainly looks like we're seeing more weakness in the tape as we look at uh, what's happening. I'm happy to be on the sidelines. I don't think it's quite time to get short yet, but that's going to be the next trade for me is look for the opportunity when it is time to short this market. I don't think that the, the long side makes any more sense. Well, you know, at least on a technical basis, that 2415 to 2420 area was kind of the bottom end range of almost all the major consolidations. The fact that we're a few points below there already is just showing the general weakness of this price action. Maybe that uh, gun lack scenario of weakness in the, like a correction in the summer market here is is plausible in this environment. Nonetheless, uh, let's talk about that dollar index because uh, the euro just o- overnight took off onto the upside again and, and the U- US dollar index just rolls over, rolled over and we're now trading in that kind of 95.50 level as it's uh, trading right now at about three o'clock on Thursday. Now, uh, what's your thinking on the dollar index here? Well, we had a nice little bounce all the way up to 96 and change, and we're back to a 95 handle now. So definitely, I, I do have a secular bull view for the U.S. dollar. It ain't happening right now. It's uh, This tape looks pretty ugly. Question is, how much more downside is there? I don't really have a technical target. I have kind of a gut feeling that 92, which was an important technical level about a year ago, might be where we, we find a bottom here, but I, I really don't have a strong opinion. I want to ask Tian about that. I think it really is going to be uh, interesting to see what happens in Europe. I think it is the Euro story that's driving this, and uh, we'll find out in, in what the market tells us. I don't really have a target for where it's going to bottom. 
Now, I'd really love to hear from you on what's going on with crude oil. Like we had some of these inventory numbers coming out and it just seems like uh, oil just can't get any traction here. Well, exactly as we predicted last week, there was a rally which continued right up to the 50-day moving average, and then it reversed dramatically on Wednesday before any inventory information came out. Normally, crude oil inventory comes out Wednesday morning. It was delayed this week by a day because of the holiday. So it seemed like before we had any inventory information, we were already seeing a reversal, and uh, this bounce in prices didn't make it all the way back to 49 or 50 as some people thought it would. It got as far as its 50-day moving average and rolled back over. Then came inventory. Holy cow. First API on Wednesday afternoon, then DOE on Thursday morning. Crude oil, 6.3 million barrel epic drawdown on inventories and obviously a very bullish signal for the crude oil market. Cushing, uh, Oklahoma, 1.3 million barrel drawdown. Gasoline, 3.6 million barrel drawdown. Distillates, 1.9 million barrel drawdown. So huge, huge drawdowns across the board. That, of course, sent crude oil prices just rocketing higher to the upside for all of about an hour or so. And, you know, it didn't last so far. I don't actually know if there was a specific proximal catalyst at 120 this afternoon on Tuesday, which is when the selling really took off. But we've already retraced all of the gains that came out. So if you've got that kind of bullish inventory report and you can't even get to the end of the day without, uh, you know, exhausting it and reversing back to the downside, it really speaks to the weakness of the market overall. In the past, I might have been tempted to write off the big draw down to weather in, say, Tropical Storm Cindy might have delayed the arrival of some imports into Houston that might have been responsible for an artificially large drawdown. That uh, analysis has gotten more complex as the U.S. has gone to both importing and exporting crude oil products. The guy who's really on top of this is Sam Madani. So Sam's going to join us after the feature interview, and we'll go into more depth on exactly what the impacts of weather are and how they may have affected the inventory today. The big question, though, is will those across-the-board drawdowns revive the rally in crude oil prices? And boy, it sure does not look that way as of Thursday afternoon. Looks like we're headed down, and I think that we're probably headed to new lower lows. I want to ask Sam his view about the biggest news of all, though, which is what I see is OPEC and Saudi Arabia have been silent for almost a month now, which is totally out of character. So what the heck is going on? Does it have something to do with Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, taking more power in the royal family? I'm not sure. Sam follows this stuff super closely, so stay tuned for extended coverage of crude oil after the feature interview is over. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to that interview with Sam as well. So let's uh, move on, though, to gold. And uh, it, it seems like almost all commodities are sluggish here, just the way the distribution's happening in oil. It's like gold can't seem to catch an uptick and make it stick. We're right now trading around that 1224 level on gold. What are you thinking here? Well, I said last week, Patrick, that you should watch for a breakdown below the 200-day moving average, which at the time was around 1240. And if that happened, you could see an acceleration to the downside. Of course, that's exactly what happened uh, at the end of last week, beginning of this week. We saw a very rapid sell-off all the way down to a low print so far of 1216 spot 50. That was yesterday on Wednesday. Uh, So far, that's been the low print. I noticed uh, Nicola Duke had a tweet out with a little video suggesting a counter counter trend bullish trade there that she thought it had exhausted itself and was likely to bounce. I agree on a counter trend move that it was a little bit oversold there and due for a bounce, but it's a counter trend move. I think that there's still more downside in gold from here. It's a question of how much more. So I wouldn't be long unless it, I was a day trader and uh, inclined to pursue that probably short lived bounce. I think eventually it will exhaust itself and we'll see more downside. Well, you know, what I really want to move on to now here and talk about is these uh, treasury bonds. Like what a flip-flop from one week to the next. We find ourselves uh, down at some really nice low lows on the yields. uh, And suddenly, just in a week, we find ourselves trading uh, almost at the 240 level on the 10-year treasury yields. What are you thinking here? 
Yeah, you know, there was a critical support level in yields at around 2 spot 12, and we touched it one day, and I think that was two or three weeks ago. And I said in that show, yeah, we're having a little bounce off of that. Well, guess what? It's not a bounce anymore. This is much bigger than that. Caught me by surprise. We're still trying to get Jeff Gundlach on the program from Double Line. He very politely declined our invitation, but it sounds like we may be able to get someone else from the Double Line team on the program to comment on this, because they've certainly been extremely prescient in their calls on this treasury market. Uh, we're back to two spot 40. I haven't talked to Juliet de Klerk this week. I don't know whether she's still recommending that people stay long or not, but the move back up to 240 is much bigger than I expected. I thought we were going to bounce around in the in the teens and maybe hit the low two spot 20s, and then we were going to move to lower yields from there. Hasn't gone that way, so I'm adjusting my thinking. I'd uh, definitely want to ask Tian about this, but I really hope that we can get someone from Double Line on the program. So uh, cross your fingers, folks. We're doing the best we can behind the scenes on that one. This week's featured interview guest is Tian Young, head of the Research of Variant Perception. Be sure to get the chart book download. The link is in your Research Roundup email. If you have not yet registered, look for the instructions next to Tian's photo on the homepage. Eric's interview with Tian is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me next on the program is Tian Yang, who heads up the research department at Variant Perception. For anyone who's not connecting the dots, Variant Perception, of course, is Jonathan Tepper's company. We interviewed Jonathan Tepper several months ago on the program. What I'm really glad to see in the beginning of your chart book, and for our listeners, if you didn't already get it, you definitely want to download the chart book. The link is in your research roundup email if you're not yet registered. We told you earlier in the program how to register and get the download. I see here that you're starting, because I think to some people, the very name of your company, Variant Perception, is not even clear. Talk to us a little bit about the process that you use and how you identify these trading opportunities that are perhaps a step outside of where the herd is going. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I think when you look at macro, oftentimes specific events will seem very unique when uh, when people look back in history. So, you know, you get housing bust, you get Russia default. And so often it's not clear if you can um, repeat the investment processes you had at the time. What we've tried to do at Varian Perception is essentially try and create a framework that's robust and repeatable. So we've looked back at the various historical boom and bust cycles and tried to figure out what is persistent through time and in different kind of political regimes and economic environments such that we can create this framework. So, you know, here we're heavily influenced by the works of the, like, uh, of the likes of Kindleberger, you know, and Minsky and so forth. And so what we got out of that is basically what we see here um, on slide two of the presentation. Essentially to us, there's two key cycles that we want to focus on. One is the growth cycle, the economic cycle, and the second is the liquidity cycle. Now, obviously, lots of people talk about growth cycles, and there's lots of different definitions. For us, there's really two key things we want to focus on here. One is where leading economic indicators are taking us. So that's a very short-term three- to six-month kind of cycle. And then two is we're looking at very much investment or inventory to sales. So this is giving you a sense of longer-term where we are in, um, in the typical growth cycle. Um, in terms of liquidity, typically what we're looking for is, again, two things. One is this idea of excess liquidity, which I think Jonathan um, discussed at length last time, um, which is this idea that when money is created in the economic system, if it is, it is um, not being used by the real economy, then it, it is excess and therefore will tend to flow into asset markets and tend to support asset markets. And then the second component of liquidity is really when we talk about the credit cycle. So really it's about are people demanding to borrow more or are they and are banks willing to lend more? So when we think about macro in that context, this can give us a very clear uh, sense of where we are both in terms of the wider cycle and where we are for the next three to six months. And so, you know, I think this is a framework that you can consistently apply when we look at the U.S., when we look at China. And obviously, as we go through the presentation, we'll kind of get to, um, get to the details of how we actually do that. Well, that's great because I couldn't agree more that, you know, it's interesting to talk about theoretical fundamentals uh, of supply and demand, but who's got money to spend <laughs> counts a lot more. And I think the credit cycle is going to be very important. I know you've got a slide coming up on that, so I don't want to jump ahead. Let's talk, though, about your next point here, which is three pillars of global macro being U.S., China, and global liquidity. I, I know that those are very important to me, but I'm guessing your reasons for that may be a little different. So please elaborate a little bit on what you mean by those three key pillars. Yeah, sure. I think, obviously, over time, as the world economy changes, 
a certain key things you have to get right to get the broad direction right. And obviously right now, you know, the world we live in, the U.S. is obviously still a very big economy, but China's influence is, even though everyone aware, is aware that China is very big, it's probably people still underestimate how, just how much impact China has in terms of the global growth cycle, in terms of global deflation and global liquidity. So these days, you know, before you get into any of the nitty gritty in terms of how to structure a trade or, you know, if you want to look at some of the proxy markets, really you have to decide, do we get the U.S. economy? Do we understand China? And do we understand global liquidity? So that's why I've kind of called it the three pillars here. And that's why I think that's the main thrust of the presentation here. And the next slide, you make the point that the U.S. growth cycle is very long in the tooth. I couldn't possibly agree more with you on that. But, you know, I've been saying this. We had Raul Paul on the program probably more than a year ago now, making that same argument that, hey, it's, it's, it's crazy that this growth cycle has gone on so long. What is causing it to extend so far beyond historical means? What's going to be the catalyst to turn this around? That's a great point. Obviously, typically, historically, the average U.S. growth cycle has been about five years. Obviously, now we're going to the eighth um, year of this one. But the one thing I would say about that is, obviously, there's no magic number here in terms of when the cycle ends. It's just more to give us a sense of, um, are we closer to the end or the beginning? And if we need to start looking out for catalysts. So obviously, on slide four here, what I've shown is um, some charts that tend to be more structural in nature. So they give you a a good sense of where in the grand scheme of things we are in this five to six year kind of eight year cycle. So obviously, you know, when we look at things like U.S. inventory to sales, when we look at private domestic investment, you know, the, the chart hasn't changed much from a year ago, but the message is broadly similar in that we're clearly nearer to the next recession than the beginning. Therefore, it's important to pay attention to what the cyclical lead indicators are doing. And I think that's the key difference, where even a year ago, six months ago, even today, we know we're laying the cycle, but you need to focus on where leading economic indicators are going to get a sense of the timing. And so if we move on to slide five here, we can see some of our cyclical leading indicators. So these will tend to be a bit more reactive, tend to project out three to six months. And it's here that we can see why, despite a lot of the structural, typical late cycle signs we see in some of the more longer term data, like inventory to sales, in, in terms of three to six month cycle, we're still very much in um, this temporary upswing. And really you want to wait for US LEIs to turn down and be aligned with the longer term cycles. And that's when you really want our worrying. So it's not quite time to worry yet, and it looks like your outlook for a U.S. recession is it's still not quite time yet. Is that correct? Yeah. So, I'm, I mean, I think the one thing to – something that we think about a lot and um, a mental model we use, this idea of insiders versus outsiders. So – because we're sat here day to day looking at the data, looking at the models, there's a tendency to obviously get very tied up into the specifics. And sometimes it's helpful to just take a step back and say, you know, if an alien dropped in from Mars and looked at all the data, what would he think? So I think very much this idea of the long in the tooth, the fact that these structural indicators show we're late cycle is an outsider perspective. It's just important to be aware that and on the balance of probability, which way we want to be looking. But then you want to get into the nitty gritty of looking at leading indicators. And so in particular, Obviously, in, you know, after the U.S. election last year, you had a lot of the survey data, you know, surge, you had your curve steepen. So you had a lot of um, positive data, and that's basically uh, responsible for this uptick we see our indicator here. So, you know, that's telling us that despite late cycle, this, it's not quite there, and you kind of need to keep dancing whilst the cycle's turning, while the short-term cycle's turning up. However, because the outsider model also warns us that we're closer to the next recession than the last, it's very important to focus in now on the recession risks. And so this is why I've kind of devoted a separate chart separate slide here on the slide six to U.S. recession. Because I think, you know, right now, even though markets are making all-time highs and, you know, people seem somewhat comfortable, this is definitely the number one macro risk to watch out for as we go into the second half of the year. Because I think, you know, there's a general misconception about how people think about re re recessions. Typically, you see a lot of these charts where people will plot, say, industrial production or, you know, retail sales, and then they'll plot it over the last 50 years and say, hey, you know, every time this has turned negative, there's previously been a recession. Look, it's turned negative now. Therefore, you know, there's a recession. To us, recession doesn't really work like that. It's not a continuous process where, you know, we very smoothly go from slowing down to recession and go back. To us, it's kind of like a phase shift. So it's like a jump process in a way. So when we build our models, look at a U.S. recession, we're really trying to detect this idea of a phase shift. So when we build our models, we use, for example, Markov switching models. But really, the key idea is that with a phase shift, things can change very quickly. And so it's important to watch, watch the data closely. 
I would make the argument, as we discussed at the very beginning, that post the great financial crisis, liquidity is more important than ever. And you are saying here in your next slide that the U.S. credit cycle has definitely rolled over. I notice that you're not saying that may be coming. That's uh, an already happened. So what does that tell us about this whole story? Almost all indicators we look at that track the U.S. credit cycle show us we're very, very late in the cycle. If you look at Fed loan surveys, if you look at the real growth of U.S. total bank assets, these are all slowing down dramatically. And this is obviously a huge concern because the Fed has started to raise rates. You know, in a typical credit cycle, behavior tends to change as the cycle matures. So obviously, later on in the cycle, you've had a lot of inverted balance sheets, a lot of bad balance sheet structures embedded in the economy so that as rates start going up and as banks don't want to lend anymore, suddenly people's mindset shift. In, your loan office is no longer thinking about keeping money from the loans. People start to worry about return of principal. And so when we see evidence of asset growth slowing, when we see evidence that lending standards are tightening, that's what really worries us because that's typically when you, when you get that shift in mindset, it's very hard for that to turn around. And so to us, it's very clear that in terms of credit cycle, people are moving towards a return of capital and capital preservation mindset, which makes us a lot more vulnerable today than we've been um, at any point in the last five or six years. In terms of global liquidity, which I think we agree is very important, tell us a little bit about what metrics you use. How do you measure the available liquidity and what are your indicators telling you? Uh, yeah, sure. So I think we cover this um, on slide eight. To us, there's obviously a lot of definitions of liquidity, but what we found that consistently actually lead risk asset prices is what we call global excess liquidity. Now, this is typically, we define as narrow real money growth minus economic growth. As I mentioned earlier, this is the idea that when uh, central banks, when commercial banks, when the entire financial system is creating extra money, it goes to, contributes towards growth and inflation. And then whatever is left will tend to flow into asset prices. So this is what we call excess liquidity. Obviously, when this is rising, there will tend to be a sea of liquidity that will tend to flow into the market by the dip and act as a support. But when excess liquidity is falling, um, obviously you don't have that safety net there. So I think to us the key analogy is that when excess liquidity is good, there's a safety net to the market. But today, excess liquidity is actually falling. So we no longer have a safety net. This doesn't mean obviously the market will sell off tomorrow, but it certainly means as a whole, risk assets are a lot more vulnerable to drawdowns, which is why I think in an environment where excess liquidity is falling, it makes a lot more sense to raise some cash level and to um, actually spend some premium on tail hedges because in that when we're into this lowering liquidity environment, a lot of those, you know, five to one, ten to one payoff type trades that they're, obviously they're five and five to one, ten to one for a reason, right? Because they're very low probability. But in this kind of environment, it suddenly starts making a lot more sense. So today, I think that's really something we're, we're watching very closely: the fact that global asset liquidity um, is falling. I think an analogy that we almost tend to overuse, but I think is, is super appropriate, is this idea of if you're trying to balance a ruler on your finger, fingertips, and the ruler falls off, why does it fall off? It could be because the wind blew or somebody bumped into you, but those tend to be proximate causes. The fundamental cause was that it was unstable to start with because you're trying to balance ruler on, on your fingertips. And so to us, when global excess liquidity is falling, we're very much into a fundamentally unstable um, state of the market. So now suddenly it makes a lot more sense to pay attention to tail hedges to have own a lot more of these um, bearish, uh, bearish risk asset trades. We've seen some interesting sudden moves in markets in the last several weeks. A few weeks ago, tech stocks sold off very suddenly and with no apparent proximal catalyst or trigger. There have been a, a few very sudden moves in the S&P. Do you think that those are early warnings of you know something being wrong with the available market liquidity? Or is that just a coincidence and those are, per, I mean, on a percentage basis, that tech stock, stock sell-off was nothing? But if you look at how quickly it happened and how it happened with no apparent news event as a catalyst, it made me kind of wonder, is, is liquidity drying up in the markets? Is there a connection there? We certainly think so. And obviously, it's not just that. For example, you had the Brazil sell-off as well a few weeks back. So I think a lot of these are signs that when people run for the door, the liquidity they expect to is not necessarily there. And so I think a lot of these signs are early warning signs that we need to pay attention. Now, clearly, given what I said earlier about the fact that short term, the US LEIs are still at a high level, but that doesn't mean obviously go out and short everything. But it certainly means that in, in, in terms of context, you want to start reducing your beta exposure, raising some cash levels, adding on some of these tail hedges. And tell us how China fits into the story as you guys see it. So China's been an interesting one. We actually um, were cyclically very bullish on China throughout 2016, back when the market consensus was clearly that China was actually going to blow up. So, you know, I had a very memorable trip 
at the beginning of 2016 where we saw, you know, 20 odd clients. And I just remember everybody was short RMB at that point, you know, even guys who weren't necessarily macro guys who, were, you know, used to be value guys. And so what was interesting was at that moment, peak pessimism, our China leading indicator the indicator had um, actually turned up very, very strongly. So both our China growth and China liquidity leading indicators turned up very strongly at that point. So throughout 2016, we were actually um, uh, very bullish. Now, today, we've almost started having the opposite effect, where the market consensus has gone towards, you know, China, China values there. You know, obviously, you've got the MSCI inclusion. Obviously, you've got RMB strengthening at the moment. So the sentiment's a bit better. There's some inflows into China. But today, our China... Growth lead indicator is actually topping, whilst our China liquidity indicator has actually fallen uh, quite dramatically. So we kind of almost have the mirror image of what we had back then. If you look on slide nine here, the, the bottom left-hand chart here shows our China physical activity indicator. So this is basically uh, a proxy using things like you know cement, steel production, um, auto sales, building completions, and so forth. So you can see, you know, after that surge, things have actually started slowing down a bit. But what's really the kicker here is if you look at the top right-hand chart liquidity is really falling in China, in particular liquidity that used to be provided by the shadow banking system. So to us, these are some major warning signs, and we're actually very proactively pushing short China trades and to take advantage of the current kind of um, benign market view towards China, because if you look at you know, the likes of implied volatility on CNH, you know, it's never really been as cheap as this in the past year or two. So this is actually very, very attractive levels to start adding short China exposure. And indeed, you can see that even inside China, there's, the authorities are probably starting to get a bit more worried. The right-hand chart here is quite interesting. It shows the different house price indices that used to track house prices in China. What's really interesting is the black line here is the Sofong Index actually stopped being published at the beginning of this year. So apparently they voluntarily discontinued publishing it for the benefit of the Chinese economy. And so it, when you see things like this, it shows you that you know, people are getting nervous about the data coming out of China. And so when people are nervous, sometimes they just start publishing it. But even though they start publishing it, there's still good signs that the housing slowdown might be a bit more dramatic than people think. Typically, house prices in China will tend to track closely with volume. So as we see, the volume of real estate transactions actually falling. So that suggests prices are coming off. So there's a number of these signs that suggest to us that things are actually getting a bit more nervy, nervy inside China and that a lot of this optimism towards China right now is quite misplaced. And it does look, though, that your view is about China rolling over. It's, you're, you're not in the camp that says China's about to blow up, as some people are still saying. Would you comment on just, you know, Kyle Bass, for example, has said that China's just enormous credit expansion since 2009 will eventually force just mm. a, a massive credit crisis in China. It's going to force the PBOC to devalue the yuan. It's going to send a, a, a crippling wave of deflation around the world and lead to the next global financial crisis. It sounds like that that's not your view at all. So do you think that there's any possibility of those things? Do you think the people that see it that way are not seeing the story correctly? Uh, give us a little bit more perspective. Uh, yeah, sure. So obviously, Carl Bass you know, is a very smart guy. He's been very successful. But obviously, clearly, on China, you've had lots of very famous smart investors on both sides of the equation. So for example, Hugh Hendry has obviously been you know, quite bullish at the same time. To us, we view China as basically an analogy to Japan after the bust in the, 19, in, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. So we see China not playing out in this acute one-off big deval type crisis, but more like Japan, where the problems of over, uh, over-indebtedness are there, but it gets just dragged out for many, many years. Ultimately, we think that if they're going to devalue it because the government wants to, not because they will be forced into it. China has, as we've seen today, uh, this year so far, where they've managed to clamp down on capital outflows quite heavily, they have more tools than people expect with a typical Western economy. So, you know, it's, it's very unrealistic to expect the market to force their hand because, you know, they've been doing this for the past 20, 30 years. And because they don't have a lot of foreign debt and because a lot of the debt is denominated in, in, um, in yuan, they're unlikely to be forced. So that's why we think the Japan analogy is very similar. So if you look back in the Japan boom and bust cycle, they have a very similar way of allocating credit. In Japan, it was also a lot about relationships. It was not so much driven by credit risk. And this is what we see in China. You know, people are making loans based on government connections, you know, based on understanding this political faction will bail out these industries. People are in general, they're not using credit risk to make to allocate. So from that point of view, it's possible then to carry on rolling over the loans, trying to kick the can down the road and just drag this thing out. And I think we tend to view China in the context of this big secular kind of slowdown like Japan. Now, having said that, even within this big secular slowdown, you can still get huge waves 
uh, of market moves. So there's still lots of opportunities, both on the long and short side. So back, I think, in, um, for Japan, in the, from um, 1990 to 2003, I think they had um, three episodes where that, the Nikkei was up more than 50%. And we think that there'll be similar opportunities in China where you can get huge rallies like we saw last year in China-related assets like commodities. But then subsequently, once the temporary liquidity boost is over, then those rallies kind of peter out and things fall back, and then they'll try and step on the, step on the pedal again. So I think that's kind of how we're seeing China at the moment. That's a, an excellent macro backdrop for the whole global economy. Let's bring it back around to U.S. equities and uh, a subject that's obviously near and dear to investors' hearts. What does all this mean for the equity market? I think when you add up the fact that we're late cycle, but we don't have a recession on the horizon, but liquidity is falling and we could get a China risk, that suggests to us, um, as I said earlier, to reduce risk, but not to be outright short. I think you still have to have some exposure and some skin in the game. But clearly, you need to be somewhat more flexible. So some of our favorite hedges recently has been looking at plays on, for example, the euro-dollar curve, playing for Fed, for the Fed potentially not hiking, because a lot of the payoffs here are very, very good. So that if you get the kind of shock event out of China, for example, then the Fed is unlikely to hike. But then because of these seven or eight to one type payoffs that are currently available on some of the core spreads, then suddenly, you know, you have that kind of liquidity in your portfolio to withstand some of these um, drawdowns that could be coming. I would say this probably isn't the big one yet because typically really big falls in equities are cascade falls. So that basically means financial markets and the real economy start feeding into each other. So the real economy weakens, which drags asset prices down, which feeds back into the real economy. And so far, we haven't really seen that where typically you've had maybe one part of the economy being weak, but not both at the same time. And before we see that, it's very unlikely we get this kind of 30% kind of big, you know, end of the cycle type uh, sell-off. In fact, I think if we go back to um, slide six, the bottom right-hand chart there, you can kind of see how we tend to break things down between the hard economic data inputs into our recession models and the soft market data or survey data that go into it. And you can see that typically you need both to, to be signaling recession for us to really want to take the kind of defensive actions that recession would necessitate. So it's really interesting, for example, at the beginning of 2016, when, you know, markets were selling off and generally speaking, people were freaking out about U.S. recession back then. Well, you know, our, our recession model basically showed almost 0% chance of recession at that time, mainly because, yes, we saw that soft market data was signaling recession, but the hard economy data wasn't. So today we kind of have a slight reverse situation where a lot of the soft and market data has improved markedly, but a lot of the fundamental data, you know, things like truck sales, building permits growth has started rolling over and slowing down. But again, that just suggests to us that we're laying the cycle, but you really need both to give us that huge, huge kind of cascade fall. Overall, net net, we think it's prudent to be allocating less risk because in the grand scheme of things, we're laying the cycle, but it doesn't make sense to be trying to fight the market and go outright short right here. Let's move on to fixed income and bond yields on uh, slide 11. We've had quite a few different views on this program about the big picture. So why don't we start with that before we get into the, the immediate term. Jeff Gundlach famously declared the 35-year bond bull market to be over. Do you guys have a view as to whether or not there's any truth to that? And what do you think is likely to happen mm -hmm. next? Yeah, so this is obviously, again, an interesting one where, you know, on the one hand, you do have, you know, gun lag, but then on the other hand, you have guys like Lacey Hunt, you know, talking about the, the trend continuing. To be honest, I think within our framework, we're not smart enough to make a call on something that's 30 years out. But what we can do is try and focus on some of them, what we do think we have an edge on, which is some of the leading indicators we have for U.S. growth, for U.S. inflation, for U.S. wages, which are ultimately obviously very important to driving fair value assumptions for where yields should be. And so, you know, from that point of view, what we see today is that we do still expect U.S. wage growth to pick up. We still expect to see moderate inflation. And you know, we still expect to see moderate growth. And so when you add it all together, it does seem like there's a lot of macro forces that do suggest rates, the fair value of rates should probably be slightly higher. Now, clearly, that's one way of looking at it. The other side of it, the risk, obviously, is that, you know, as, um, as euphoria about risk assets, you know, about Trump, led reflation, these things peter out, then clearly people go back to the kind of secular stagnation view. So I think that's what people kind of oscillate in between. So for us, I think those two, it's not super clear which of those forces are actually going to win out in the end. But we do think that in the meantime, because you have this kind of these two things on either side of the market, it does create a lot of tactical opportunities. So on slide 11, the bottom left-hand chart here, is, you know, it's one of our favorite charts and something that has worked very well historically and indeed over the past few years. It just basically shows the total return of holding 10-year U.S. treasuries on a year-on-year -year basis. And what you find is that 
typically when performance gets very good and people pile in, then market becomes over position. You get a flip, and then equally, if people get too bearish and you get kind of the, you know the lower the lower kind of standard deviation here on the chart, then typically you expect a bounce. So what's interesting is that technically today, Treasury, U.S. Treasuries, the total return wise has sold off, um, or the, rather the total return has gone down sufficiently that we're at the bottom kind of minus one standard deviation. So from here, it actually does suggest we should see some more of a rally in fixed income. So rates going a bit lower. And indeed, this does tend to line up with the seasonality as well. So tactically, I do think the bullish U.S. fixed income trade makes sense. But I think the me- in the medium term, inflation wages might not be the kind of huge kind of wage inflation spiral that would justify the ending of a bond bull market. But certainly, I think we'll see moderate inflation and wages, which actually means, you know, you can't stick with the secular stagnation view for the rest of this year. You really need to see those lead indicators for inflation wages turned down before you go back on that view. Tian, a lot of people have observed that high yield junk bonds have not really reversed as you would expect them to because there's so much risk in the high yield market associated with shale oil drillers. And a lot of people assumed that if we saw a rollover in oil prices, which we have definitely seen, that that would cause high yield to take a nosedive. And there's been some correction there, but it's not a nosedive. How do you see that market? And is there an opportunity there? Yeah, again, the overall context has obviously been that in an environment when liquidity had been abundant and in the chase for yield, obviously, you know, the extra kind of uh, basis points of yield you pick up, investing in high yield is what kind of drag people into, into the trade. However, as we kind of covered earlier on, today when the Fed may be starting to hike, when, you know, there's a lot of signs the credit cycle is late cycle and where there are signs that excess liquidity is starting to fall, then this is the kind of environment where we could really get a sell-off here. To us, high yield spreads are probably some of the most mispriced instruments out there today. And the short there certainly looks very, very compelling. Even in terms of absolute level, the credit spreads are basically back to cycle lows. So yeah, I think that's definitely an area. Investors are buying into high yield because the trailing sharp ratio has been very good. It's basically like equities with a lower volatility. But now that the, the kind of macro regime has changed, in particular the credit and liquidity regime, we do think that's actually a very, very compelling um, way to add, add a hedge to a portfolio or to actually do um, outright short trade. Okay, so long uh, treasuries and short high yield, uh, it sounds like is the trade. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move. Let's move on to the U.S. dollar. We've seen, uh, I think, a lot of surprises for the dollar bulls in the dollar index chart. We've had a lot of arguments on this program for why the secular dollar rally should continue, but should or sh- should and will <laughs> seem to be two different things. How do you see this? Yeah, so the dollar's been interesting when uh, one of our key themes for um, this year was that we thought the dollar would go down but in, um, in a trading range kind of fashion, which is actually what's actually played out to now. Um, the main reason had been that we thought dollar valuations were very high at the same time as real rates in the U.S. not justifying such a strong dollar rally. So the fact that we didn't see higher real rates in the U.S. meant that we didn't uh, expect a lot of capital inflows into the U.S., which meant that a lot of the speculative long positionings had to be unwound. Now, today, I think we've, we've seen some of the unwind, but clearly, if you look at the bottom left-hand chart here, which breaks down speculative positioning on the dollar versus DM and EM currencies. It's mostly being EM that people have been going long and short dollar against. In terms of other DM currencies, the positioning has still yet to unwound a bit, which is why I think overall there's still scope for the US dollar to trend a bit lower. To us, really, the key driver of, fixing, uh, of um, FX sorry, is um, real rate differentials. And so here, the top right-hand chart gives a very good illustration where real rates are for dollar versus other developed countries. And clearly, we're just very much reverting to where the dollar index probably should be, given the fact that real rate differentials are not very high. The thing about the secular dollar bull market, I think I'm more probably a fan of um, the dollar smile theory that I think Stephen Jem um, originally put forward, which is the idea that the dollar basically does really well when the U.S. economy is either doing really poorly or really well. So, I, so basically, the dollar is rallying in one of those risk-off scenarios or in a, in a scenario where real rates in the U.S. are going up because the U.S. economy is doing well. To me, it feels like we're, we're, in, we're not at either of those extremes at the moment. We're still somewhat stuck in the middle, which is why, you know, given the smile, we'd expect dollar to actually uh, perform rather poorly. Do you have a downside target for the dollar index? We're not really um, technical experts, so I don't necessarily have a level, but I do think, obviously, clearly on a lot of technical indicators, things are getting, um, getting to a point where the dollar is a bit oversold. So I, I think the way we're trying to position tactically is saying sell rallies. So we're looking at drawing the trend and selling, selling dollars. We move towards um, the top end of the channel. 
Let's move over to Europe, because that obviously has a big uh, part to play in this dollar story. A lot of people seem to be acting like Europe's problems are over. I, I personally don't see it that way. I think they're just beginning. But uh, what do you see in terms of the outlook for further European exit contagion, where the sit various situations, there's almost too many to, to mention, are going between France and the UK and so forth? Yeah, I think I absolutely agree with you here. I think that the longer term structural picture hasn't really changed despite, you know, all the euphoria around, you know, Macron and further integration. Now, I think we might need to break this down again into the kind of, you know, three to six months view versus the structural picture. Because obviously right now, given the fact that economic data is um, improving in Europe, you have had leading indicators across both the core and the periphery surge recently. And, you know, given the noise coming out of the ECB, it probably doesn't quite make sense to stand in the way of the freight train cars yet. But clearly, in terms of breakup zones, it's very, very unlikely that the Europeans are going to be able to figure out this euro problem. We've gone back and looked at the history of various currency unions. And historically, all currency unions are made for political reasons and break up uh, because eventually the core gets sick of subsidizing the, the periphery and then the core breaks it up. So I think that's a very useful um, analog to see where Europe is at today. Historical examples would be, say, when the ruble zone broke up after the, um, the Soviet Union, um, after Soviet Union disintegration, where essentially in the end it was Russia that decided they were sick of um, all the various satellite countries free riding off the, off, um, the cheap money that they were creating. And so it was Russia that broke it up. So today what we're focused on is actually what the core is doing and not necessarily what the periphery is doing. To us, a lot of the noise around, for example, Italy leaving Greece, these are probably somewhat more of a red herrings that will cause a market reaction, but those are the opportunities to buy the dip. What's really the key to watch for is the core and whether the core is trying to move further away or towards integration. So for now, what we see is that the likes of Germany and France are, are trying to pull towards further integration and, and trying to keep it together. But that basically really means they're still happy to subsidize the periphery and to run monetary policy like it should for the periphery. I mean, if you look at, say, like the Taylor rule and what it would recommend interest rates should be, you know, the Taylor rule that you know, it's like 6%. Euro European rates are probably 6% too low for Germany, but they're just about right for the likes of Spain and Italy. So right now, a lot of the European projects being run for the periphery. But, you know, as, in, as, as we carry on, say, you know, when, when the economy slows down or we get a U.S. recession, we get China-related growth slowdown, when suddenly in the core people start feeling the economic pain again, suddenly at that point, I think, you know, a lot of the kind of the, the populism, the kind of anti-euro sentiment will start to come back. And I think that's the number one thing to watch for, for the um, kind of eventual breakup risk. So for now, I do think that has receded. And given the improvement in data, you don't really want to fight it. But structurally, I don't think it's possible ultimately to solve the fact that when you have a fixed exchange rate, you get wildly divergent real effective exchange rates within Europe. And given that the European countries trade amongst themselves, you're never going to be able to kind of offset that. And so Germany is always going to benefit because they will always have a lower real effective exchange rate relative to everybody else. And so it's only when that creates enough problems for Germany politically that we'll likely see this kind of euro disintegration story pick back up. So it sounds like the trading strategy is essentially get out of the way of this freight train of euphoria, but then get ready for reality to sink back in at some point in the future. Yeah. With a particular I mean, focus there's some potential on... Capitalists. Well, and right. I guess what I'm... Per I'm particularly interested in is it sounds like Germany is going to play a pivotal role in this because they are very much at the center. At the same time, Germany is, uh, in my opinion, up against some pretty difficult political challenges right now. If this refugee crime situation gets much worse, I think there's going to be a real division in Germany about whether or not the current leadership is, uh, is on the right track or whether to change it. Does that potentially create the catalyst that brings about this change of direction? direction from the center that you talked about earlier? Yeah, yeah, possibly. Obviously, we don't claim to be political experts, but, but that could be any number of things. So I think that might be a potential flashpoint, but probably an even bigger flashpoint ultimately is the fact that for the German, the reason Germany has, you know, is running such a big current account surplus, has, you know, such a strong economy was that they've basically done it at the expense of German workers, right, who've had lower wage growth, um, you know, they're able to kind of cons consume less and demand less, whilst a lot of the Southern Europeans obviously been borrowing money and, and living better in terms of, you know, at least through the boom years. So you've had the German population that's gone through, you know, all the hearts reforms, agreed to limit their wage growth, that kind of attitude where if they don't see the, 
the kind of periphery countries willing to do the same. And indeed, it, given the, the divergence in real effective exchange, exchange rates, you would need to see huge real wage cuts, you know, 20, 30 percent in some of the peripheral countries, which just isn't going to happen. I think that's what ultimately probably is, is what creates the discontent, where the German populace, the story becomes, we're supporting all these guys, but they don't want to be prudent. You know, they, want, they don't want to, you know, take, take less money, basically. I think that's probably going to be ultimately what the trigger point is, and that's probably what's going to be very, very kind of fertile material for um, another kind of wave of populism. We've talked about uh, China earlier and now Europe. Let's go back to Asia and talk about Japan and the situation uh, there. How do you see the Japanese economy developing, and do you think that the, you know, the people that are concerned about JGBs have got it right or wrong? What do you see going on there? Yeah, so, I mean, to us, the most significant macro event last was actually um, the BOJ decision to target yield curve. To us, this is a very close historical analogy to the Fed Treasury Accord after the Second World War in the U.S., where essentially the BOJ agreed to give up control of their balance sheet in return for capping, capping yield. Now, obviously, in Japan, technically speaking, it's not, it's not a cap, right? It's two ways, and they're targeting it. But we think in practice, it's basically a step towards monetizing the debt. When we look at Japan, I think that the big historical context is really about when hyperinflation hits. So the, the, the best book to read on this is actually uh, Peter Bernholtz, where he basically identified every single historical instance of hyperinflation and said, what are the signposts for eventual hyperinflation? And in particular, he said there were two things. The first was that uh, your budget deficit as a percentage of your total government revenues is more than 40%. And the second is that you're basically monetizing the, the budget deficit. The entire budget deficit is being covered by central bank balance sheet expansion. So Japan is the only country in the world right now that actually fits both of these descriptions. So they're basically, according to Bernholz, past the point of no return. So here it's just a case of how they try and get there. And I think you know, a lot of the moves we're seeing, for example, getting their pension funds to move out of JGBs, allocating towards you know, equities, foreign assets, these are all signs that they understand this bigger picture here, that we are, they are going to be moving towards this hyperinflation uh, kind of scenario. So, you know, for us, seeing the, the BOJ yield curve targeting, we think it really just means capping. It really means trying to create this mechanism whereby if yield curve starts see, trying to steepen, if uh, monetary velocity starts picking up, there's a mechanism there to kind of generate a lot of inflation quickly to, to kind of lower the real value of that debt. So I think that's the big kind of historical context in which this is going to happen. Now, in terms, of the sh in terms of right now in the market, clearly there's starting to be, there's been some doubts around the, the kind of Japan reflation theme this year. Obviously, if you look at um, foreigner investments in Japan, there's been actually a, a decent amount of outflows recently. But ultimately, I think this is just more positioning related and that this actually creates opportunity to get back, get back into the Japan trade. So, you know, long, long Nikkei, but hedging the FX or short, short yen. We have quite a few listeners in Australia, and since you mentioned the China situation rolling over, you know, as you know, a huge amount of Australian GDP is attributable to exports to China. So what does the China story and other factors in general uh, tell you about where the Australian economy may be headed? Yeah, absolutely. Australia, I think um, that's uh, Jonathan's favorite topic. I think he's made a lot of friends down in Australia um, point out the housing bubble there. So I, I think, broadly speaking, we obviously still think that Australia is experiencing a very big housing bubble that's going to become, that's increasingly vulnerable to a downturn. And today, we think it's actually, there's a lot of signs that lead the indicators of the housing market have actually rolled over. So if you look at building approvals in Australia, they're declining somewhere in the region of 20% year on year now. And so this is a very, very significant development. And indeed, if you look uh, across Australia, outside of the major kind of, you know, Sydney, Melbourne, in some of the other capital cities, prices have actually started uh, rolling over. Or indeed, in places like Perth, you know, commodity related, it's actually started declining. So we actually think today a lot of things are lined up in Australia to, to, go, to go back on the bearish Australia trade. Australia lean indicators are, roll, are, are rolling over, building permits are falling, yield curves are flattening. At the same time, if you look at the commentary and the general anecdotes coming out of Australia, and indeed the kind of general sell-side research, a lot of that tone has changed now as well. Most people have shifted tone towards um, being concerned about the, the Aussie banks, being concerned about the momentum in the housing market, concerned about the fact that you know, two-thirds of loans are interest only. So I think that's been a clear shifting narrative from when we kind of first discussed this um, a year ago. So today, I think the short Australia trade is actually makes a lot of sense. And indeed, you know, that, that's one of the major trades we have on as well, short, um, short Australian banks. 
Okay, I just want to touch on that because a lot of people don't understand that Australian housing debt is not securitized the way U.S. is. So you don't really have the big short equivalent in Australia. Is it just shorting the banks that you're using as the way to short the the uh, housing bubble that you see there, or is there some other technique for shorting Australian housing? I think it's the banks or indeed some of the mortgage intermediaries. I think the banks are a very clean expression of the trade because two-thirds of the bank loan books in Australia are actually housing-related, but the banks have very, very low loan loss provisions at the moment, so it's somewhere in the, in the region of 20 basis points. So there's not a lot of room for error for Australian banks at the moment. And at the same time, in terms of valuations, you know, they're trading at over two times tangible book value, whereas comparable banks, the rest of the world tend to trade one, one and a half. In Australia, it's two, two and a half. So there's a lot of things lined up that suggest Australian banks should be a very, very clean um, expression of the trade. But other than that, I think obviously short, short Aussie dollar is also quite a clean way of playing it, but that's likely to be more delayed where essentially the housing bust happens, then the banks need to be bailed out. And then so the RBA bails them out. In fact, bailing out consequence where they lower rates and then drags the Aussie dollar lower. So I think that's a slightly less direct way of doing it. Equally long Australian fixed income would be a very similar indirect way of doing it. Um, but I think short Australian banks are, are, very, are very clean and I think a very high beta way to play it. Okay. We, uh, you do have uh, some information about your company at the end of the chart book, for, but for anyone who was not able to get the download, give us just the quick 30-second bird's eye view of what you do at Variant Perception. Uh, yeah, sure. So at Varian, we provide independent investment strategy and global macro research. The key thing I would emphasize here is that we emphasize very much our investment framework. So it's about focusing on what's robust and repeatable during different economic cycles. You know, we, we're trying to kind of position ourselves as the opposite of the guru model. You know, it's not anyone, it's not just, say, Jonathan Tepper, who's, you know, the genius who's going to make the call, have the epiphany and tell you where the next blow up is going to be. We have a process that we follow to ensure we have, a, we have this repeatable way of generating investment ideas and that to, to make sure that you know, our research process is not so dependent on which side of bed Jonathan gets out of her, you know, in the morning. Well, Tian, thank you for a fantastic interview. Patrick Serezna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Uh, Eric, we got a lot of positive feedback after bringing a second guest to join us in extended crude oil market coverage in our post-game segment last week. So this week, Samir Madani, founder of the hashtag OOTT and TankerTrackers.com, joins us for more discussion on the crude oil market. Sam, welcome aboard. Hi, thanks for having me back. Now, uh, Eric, I do want to know you have a, a whole bunch of questions here for Sam, but I just wanted to actually take a moment to reflect back on that amazing interview with uh, Tian. And, uh, you know, what really stood out for me was, uh, you know, them emphasizing that while the signs of an immediate recession may not be there, the global liquidity was deteriorating. And, and I, I really kind of, in one of the reports, the way they had the analogy was that it's sort of like looking at a frozen lake in the spring, you know, it may May still look the same on the surface, but the ice is thinning. And uh, and I kind of like that analogy in a sense that when the liquidity is being drained out of the system, you know everything may look on the surface the same, but it, it's deteriorating and it's more vulnerable to a turn. And uh, and I think that that's a really good theme to have for the second half of the year. What uh, what stood out for you in the interview? Well, I guess we think alike because the same things really stood out for me. It's about liquidity. You know, the fact that this market is ridiculously overvalued in terms of any fundamental measure is not important. As Keith McCullough said, overvalued things can get more overvalued. So whether it's overvalued or not is not the question. The question is, when does that liquidity dry up? And I think the Variant Perception guys do an excellent job of tracking these indicators of global liquidity. And so I guess to summarize what I think Tian said, you know, okay, it's not time to go short the stock market yet. 
market, but it's definitely time to be raising cash. And the time to short the market is probably coming. It's interesting to me seasonally. I would have thought that we'd see a summer rally first and things would get ugly towards the end of August. Seems like maybe it's starting to happen a month or so early uh, this year in in terms of how big down years go. But I think it could be a big down year. We're just not quite at it yet. Anyway, I want to shift gears since we've got Sam here and uh, talk about crude oil some more. Sam, last week, when I looked at the inventory report or just before inventory came out, I was starting to think that I should expect a large drawdown in inventories because of Tropical Storm Cindy. And the logic there would be if the import ships coming into port can't make it into the Houston ship channel, that's going to reduce the amount of imports that hit the country and that's going to result in a drawdown at least on paper and inventories. But you had a tweet out that saved me from myself and explained why that used to be exactly the right logic, but it's actually in the reverse right now. So please explain why that used to make sense, but it doesn't anymore. Great. Thanks for asking this question, because a lot has changed over the past year after a 40-year export ban. So for 40 years, the United States could not export crude oil because it was uh, very unstrategic to do so. And so what happened is that now that the U.S. is exporting a lot, you had a lot of vessels obviously, which were still docked in port, they weren't able to leave port with their exports because of the tropical storm. And everything that was out in the Gulf had to rush into port uh, for shelter. So that's what happened. You had a, a lot of vessels come in and you had very few vessels depart. And that creates a build instead of a draw. And now the build wasn't too big at all. And we saw the exports uh, out of the U.S. was like quarter or half a million barrels a day, which is on the low side. It's more like a reflective of what the average was last year rather than this year. This year, I think it's around almost 800,000 barrels a day. And today came out the report, the EIA report, and it showed exactly what I was expecting. And that was a reaction to last week. So what happened was you had more vessels depart Uh, And that kind of compensated for for what didn't happen last week. And then you had fewer vessels come in. Also, on top of that, there's a third factor, and that's the Strategic Petroleum Reserves, the SPR. Now, when the United States sells off its uh, SPR barrels on a weekly basis, that inventory first gets uh, relabeled as commercial crude. So it gets added to commercial crude with every sale. Now, What happened was last week or last report uh, prior to this one, uh, there was a sale which amounted to like uh, 200,000 barrels a day. Uh, Whereas this report, we knew it was going to be a a lower number because every Monday comes out from the SPR. And that meant that there was not too much uh, being added to commercial inventory. Therefore, this must be a draw. And I had forecasted with my calculator close to 10 million barrels in draw. But then I revised it later on saying that no, I think I understated the imports. So I, I said between 5 and 8 million. I think it was something like uh, 6.3 million barrel draw today. Well, you certainly nailed that one. And to summarize that, it sounds like the rule is when you have a weather event, as we had last week with Tropical Storm Cindy, it results not in a drawdown, but an artificial build in inventory. But then it gets compensated out with a big drawdown the following week. That was this week. That's exactly what happened. That sent prices rocketing to the upside, at least initially. But there's another wrinkle in this story, Sam, because I know that you covered your long today. It was just the right time because because even with this, what would just huge, huge drawdowns across the board, that would normally be an incredibly bullish signal. And you'd expect a couple of days of uh, oil prices moving to the upside. It only lasted for a couple of hours this time. And you seem to know that because I know you covered your, your long right at the top. And sure enough, around 120 this afternoon, there was a huge sell-off. I still haven't figured out what the trigger was to cause that. So how did you know to get out if you saw this big build coming? How did you know that the reaction in the market would be so short-lived? So I'm recalling from last year's pain, trying to short the, all summer, and that didn't work out too well. And I remember what happened was after every EI report, the oil moved a uh, dollar and a quart or a dollar and a half uh, after a report. And when I didn't see that happen initially, when I saw it only go up 70, 80 cents, I said to myself, this thing is exhausted. There doesn't seem too much of an appetite on, uh, from the buyers. I think they're all on vacay right now. So... I decided I'll close this and see what happens. And sure enough, uh, you know, what is it, an hour after I I, I closed it, it it just, uh, or two hours, it just toppled. 
I mean, it fell over a dollar, and I'm still in awe about it. You know, nobody's come up with a good answer as to what happened, but I think it's just that the appetite's not there, and and it might take another draw. Maybe next week's report will show it before the market is beginning to become convinced that okay, seasonality is kicking in, or uh, that Saudis are are actually uh, cutting uh, for for sure now in terms of exports to the United States. Okay, Sam, so that really begs another question. What we can agree on, although neither one of us is sure exactly why, we can see that clearly the buying is exhausted. There's no supply of buyers to buy into this market, and that begs the question, why not? So to my thinking, the biggest news by far in the oil market in the last month is what OPEC and Saudi Arabia have had to say in their public statements, which is precisely nothing. Now, this is suspiciously coincident with a shakeup in the Saudi Arabian royal royal family, where Mohammed bin Salman has apparently gained a lot more power. So what do you think is going on? Is Saudi Arabia backing away from its uh, position of doing whatever it takes to support the price through the IPO of Aramco in 2018? Uh, what do you see going forward? Uh, do you have any, any sense of why Saudi Arabia is so suspiciously quiet in the wake of what it seems like a market that needs their, uh, their propaganda in order to be moved higher? About 10 days before the OPEC meeting on May 25th this year, uh, we at Tanker Trackers, we posted out our uh, weekly uh, report of what uh, Saudi Arabia and a few other countries in the Middle East export. And we noticed that there was a drop in exports to the United States in particular. And we, we said that, okay, this is coming. They have to start talking about cutting exports at OPEC. Surely that, that must be the logical thing to do next because nobody's really buying this whole thing about production cut. And we didn't see that happen. But then after the meeting, just directly after the meeting, uh, there was some tweets fired out saying that uh, Saudi Arabia is cutting exports to the United States. Then that confirmed what, what we were seeing. And sure enough, we're seeing that now. The, we, we've set up our, our, our tracking schedule and we can see that uh, right now off, the, off your coast in Gulf of Mexico, you are now receiving in oil that was sent in May. And those were the cuts. So we're tracking all of these vessels, and we can see that uh, for the past uh, week and two, that uh, that it's less and less, and it's less than the average. The average has been around uh, above one million, but now it's uh, less than a million per day. And this week in particular, I'm <laughs> I need at least another. I need tomorrow's numbers to come in in order to know for sure exactly how much this week has gone. But it's far less than last week. So I'm expecting another draw next week as a result of that. Now, there are several big analysts that have come out saying that the $42 low that we saw was probably the low, and it's going to be all uphill from here. Tracy was on the program last week, Shy Girl on Twitter, saying she has a different view. She thinks that we're headed much lower into the 30s. That's also been my view, as it looks to me like the Saudi narrative is kind of collapsing. But it sounds like from what you're saying about this reduced amount of uh, Saudi exports, that you probably would side with the banks that are saying it's uphill from here. So where do you see the market going over the next few months? I, I'm a firm believer of uh, channel range uh, when it comes to price. Uh, I, I do believe that they're also looking at it that this, this way as well, because last year we saw the reaction on August 2nd, I believe. It, it hit down to 39.50 or so. And then, boom, they came out of their, their cave and uh, they made the noise and it just it skyrocketed for three weeks straight. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, I think it went up to August 21st. It was just climbing up nearly $10. So so what is that? That's over 20, 25% or something it, it climbed in, in three weeks and it was nonstop. So I think something like that might happen again. Now what we saw was, was a reaction to, okay, Price went down and there was a short cover, but uh, something substantial has to come through. And I think that it will happen after they start seeing more consumption in the U.S. and after they, they, they've shipped the last so-called so export cut to the U.S., uh, then they'll make noise. And finally, Sam, I want to move to another topic, which is we first interviewed you on this program more than a year ago when you founded Hashtag OOTT, the Organization of Oil Trading Tweeters. And uh, from there, you also founded uh, TankerTrackers.com, which is your volunteer effort to basically share your own research with the trading community, which has been uh, just a, a real source of a fantastic wealth of information for traders. Recently, because of the fame that you've got, 
gotten, you were offered a very uh, opportune and lucrative position with a hedge fund, but you turned it down because of your commitment to tanker traders. So you're literally uh, apparently more loyal to giving away something for free to other investors than taking what sounded like a, a very lucrative uh, position with a fund. Please tell us about your decision and give us an update on what's going on with hashtag OOTT and tankertrackers.com. And particularly, when are you going to start publishing those EIA forecasts again, which were so so accurate in so many occasions? Hashtag OOTT is a living and breathing animal on its own. It's amazing. I, I had to work a lot in the beginning to to get it started, to grow the community and so on, but it has now gone viral. It's, it, you know, if you just click on the hashtag itself, you can see how many tweets there are every hour. It's just an insane amount of information, but yet it's so to the point of what people need to know and, and want to see. There are people, of course, who like to propagate their own bias in it, but I think that it all evens out at the end as fact of what's going on. What's also good is that you have a lot of journalists, analysts, ministries, even agencies such as the IEA, everyone's contributing to hashtag OTT, including so-called competition to tankertrackers.com. So I managed to get them aboard as well. So uh, the big names are, are contributing their research whenever they wish to offer something for free in order to bring an audience to their own website. So everyone wins out of using hashtag OTT. I should also add that people have been pushing us to do something about natural gas, so we made one called hashtag ONGT for natural gas, and that that started uh, off pretty nicely as well last week. However, for tankertrackers.com, what I'd like to say is that we started it about half a year ago, end of uh, December. It was our Christmas gift to the public, and what we've done since then is uh, we update it daily, uh, with with the latest uh, tanker data on how many barrels are out in sea. And also, more importantly, is that we update a lot of government statistics, official publications, and though they provide things like production, imports, and exports, we actually calculate how much of a storage change there is. And they're not even really looking at it, or they're not really talking about it, and neither are journalists and so on. So we actually present those figures, and... You know, it's shocking the numbers you see. Like we've calculated that China's added over 780 million barrels since summer of 2013. So, uh, and they keep adding every month more than what the U.S. has added so far this year. So, you know, it's quite jaw-dropping when you see this information. Now, in regards to the EIA reports, we've we've taken a break from doing those, uh, at least as a as a team. And instead, what we do is, uh, I, I've I've been doing that just lately on my own uh, so that the team can focus on the development of our new website, our 2.0 site, which will be a whole new site from scratch with a lot more data, a lot more automation as well. We're, we're working with some uh, big names who are going to provide us with a lot of data, and they volunteered to help us out uh, as long as we help them with, with a little back scratching on both sides in terms of improving their data. And we decided to keep this free. Uh, we wanted to benefit as many uh, average Joes and Janes there are out there because, you know, let's not forget, hashtag OTT was born out of the fact that uh, we wanted to get rid of these rumors. These rumors were really uncontrollable and in, in the market. So uh, if we back it up with facts, if we let people know and journalists know what's actually going on instead of being spoon-fed by just one source, it's, uh, it, it'll, it'll calm things down, obviously. And so uh, people are very, very interested in, 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 in what we post, and uh, they follow us. I, mean, I think we got like a half, half a million hits every month. Uh, so it's still growing, and it'll be a whole lot better once we launch the brand new website. I've turned down the position at a hedge fund because, you know, we get offers all the time, actually. The issue is that we decided, we made a pact internally that if one of us is gone, then we might as well close it down because they will put an obligation that you cannot work with tankertrackers.com while working here uh, tracking tankers for us. We, we made a pact that, that we want, we're going to see this thing through. We're going to launch our brand new website. We're, we're going to turn it into a massive success. And, you know, we're just a few amateurs, but what we picked up over the past year is, let's face it, it's shocking the competition. We publish stuff days and weeks before they do. And it enters into big publications such as the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times and so on. So we are a credible source. <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much for that, Sam. It's great to hear that you guys are still on track, and I know that Tanker Trackers continues to provide a fantastic wealth of information totally for free to the investing community. So thank you for all of your contributions. We are going to have to leave it there in the interest of time. Folks, we do need your help promoting the show, so please retweet us when we announce the show. Tell your friends, forward your research roundup email to your friends and colleagues. If you want to help to defray our operating expenses and production costs, use the donate button on our homepage to make a donation to Macro Voices. Use the player embed, which you can also get from our website in order to put a Macro Voices player on your own website. But most importantly, register your free account at macrovoices.com. The more registered users we have, the more able we are to bring you the very best feature interview guests. The benefit to you is that you'll receive our research roundup email, which is a compendium of links to all of the coolest free content that we could find each week on the internet. This week, you got Tian Yang's chart book. That's stuff uh, from Variant perception is normally very expensive institutional research. So you get an occasional uh, free giveaway like that, as well as the best free stuff that we can find on the internet. Patrick, tell them what else they can find in this week's research roundup. Well, uh, Eric, they can find the transcript, obviously, for the uh, interview today with uh, Tian as well. Uh, obviously, like you alluded to, there's the link to the uh, chart book from Variant Perception uh, that you can go uh, accompany with that uh, transcript. There's uh, also an article from Kessler titled, The Fed Has an Alarming Low Inflation Problem. Uh, there's uh, also a link to a short video of Kyle Bass uh, featured on CNBC discussing the tectonic shift in the U.S.-China relationship. There's also a great article article written by Jeffrey Snyder called Economic Risk Imbalance Continues. You'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MBRR hashtag on Twitter and we'll include it in our weekly distribution. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.
So uh, cross your fingers, folks. We're doing the best we can behind the scenes on that one. This week's featured interview guest is Tian Young, head of the Research of Variant Perception. Be sure to get the chart book download. The link is in your Research Roundup email. If you have not yet registered, look for the instructions next to Tian's photo on the homepage. Eric's interview with Tian is coming up as Macro Voices continues, right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me next on the program is Tian Yang, who heads up the research department at Variant Perception. For anyone who's not connecting the dots, Variant Perception, of course, is Jonathan Tepper's company. We interviewed Jonathan Tepper several months ago on the program. What I'm really glad to see in the beginning of your chart book, and for our listeners, if you didn't already get it, you definitely want to download the chart book. The link is in your research roundup email if you're not yet registered. We told you earlier in the program how to register and get the download. I see here that you're starting, because I think to some people, the very name of your company, Variant Perception, is not even clear. Talk to us a little bit about the process that you use and how you identify these trading opportunities that are perhaps a step outside of where the herd is going. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. So I think when you look at macro, oftentimes specific events will seem very unique when uh, when people look back in history. So, you know, you get housing bust, you get Russia default. And so often it's not clear if you can um, repeat the investment processes you had at the time. What we've tried to do at Varian Perception is essentially try and create a framework that's robust and repeatable. So we've looked back at the various historical boom and bust cycles and tried to figure out what is persistent through time and in different kind of political regimes and economic environments such that we can create this framework. So, you know, here we're heavily influenced by the works of the likes uh, of the likes of Kindleberger, you know, and Minsky and so forth. And so what we got out of that is basically what we see here um, on slide two of the presentation. Essentially to us, there's two key cycles that we want to focus on. One is the growth cycle, the economic cycle, and the second is re- the liquidity cycle. Now, obviously, lots of people talk about growth cycles, and there's lots of different definitions. For us, there's really two key things we want to focus on here. One is where leading economic indicators are taking us. So that's the very short-term three to six months kind of cycle. And then two is we're looking at very much investment investment or inventory to sales. So this is giving you a sense of longer term where we are in, um, in the typical growth cycle. Um, in terms of liquidity, typically what we're looking for is, again, two things. One is this idea of excess liquidity, which I think Jonathan um, discussed at length last time, um, which is this idea that when money is created in the economic system, if it is, it is um, not being used by the real economy, then it it is excess and therefore will tend to flow into asset markets and tend to support asset markets. And then the second component of liquidity is really when we talk about the credit cycle. So really it's about are people demanding to borrow more or are they and are banks willing to lend more? So when we think about macro in that context, this can give us a very clear uh, sense of where we are both in terms of the wider cycle and where we are for the next three to six months. And so, you know, I think this is a framework that you can consistently apply when we look at the U.S., when we look at China. And obviously, as we go through the presentation, we'll kind of get to um, get to the details of how we actually do that. Well, that's great, because I couldn't agree more that, you know, it's interesting to talk about theoretical fundamentals uh, of supply and demand, but who's got money to spend (laughs) counts a lot more. And I think the credit cycle is going to be very important. I know you've got a slide coming up on that, so I don't want to jump ahead. Let's talk, though, about your next point here, which is three pillars of global macro being U.S., China, and global liquidity. I I know that those are very important to me, but I'm guessing your reasons for that may be a little different. So please elaborate a little bit on what you mean by those three key pillars. Yeah, sure. I think, obviously, over time, as the world economy changes, there are certain key things you have to get right to get the broad direction right. And obviously, right now, you know, the world we live in, the U.S. is obviously still a very big economy, but China's influence is, even though everyone aware, is aware that China is very big, it's probably people still underestimate how, just how much impact China has in terms of the global growth cycle, in terms of global deflation and global liquidity. So these days, you know, before you get into any of the nitty gritty in terms of how to structure a trade or, you know, if you want to look at some of the proxy markets, really you have to decide, do we get the U.S. economy? Do we understand China? And do we understand global liquidity? So that's why I've kind of called it the three pillars here. And that's why I think that's the main thrust of the presentation here. 
And the next slide, you make the point that the U.S. growth cycle is very long in the tooth. I couldn't possibly agree more with you on that. But you know, I've been saying this. We had Raul Paul on the program probably more than a year ago now, making that same argument that, hey, it's, it's, it's crazy that this growth cycle has gone on so long. What is causing it to extend so far beyond historical means? What's going to be the catalyst to turn this around? That's a great point. Obviously, typically, historically, the average U.S. growth cycle has been about five years. Obviously, now we're going to the eighth um, year of this one. But the one thing I would say about that is, obviously, there's no magic number here in terms of when the cycle ends. It's just more to give us a sense of, um, are we closer to the end or the beginning? And if we need to start looking out for catalysts. So obviously on slide four here, what I've shown is um, some charts that tend to be more structural in nature. So they give you a, a good sense of where in the grand scheme of things we are in this five to six year, kind of eight year cycle. So obviously, you know, when we look at things like U.S. inventory to sales, when we look at private domestic investment, you know, the, the chart hasn't changed much from a year ago, but the message is broadly similar in that we're clearly nearer to the next recession than the beginning. Therefore, it's important to pay attention to what the cyclical lead indicators are doing. And I think that's the key difference, where even a year ago, six months ago, even today, we know we're late in the cycle, but you need to focus on where leading economic indicators are going to get a sense of the timing. And so if we move on to slide five here, we can see some of our cyclical leading indicators. So these will tend to be a bit more reactive, tend to project out three to six months. And it's here that we can see why, despite a lot of the structural, typical late cycle signs we see in some of the longer term data, like inventory to sales, in, in terms of three to six month cycle, we're still very much in um, this temporary upswing. And really, you want to wait for US LEIs to turn down and be aligned with the longer term cycles. And that's when you really want to start worrying. So it's not quite time to worry yet, and it looks like your outlook for a U.S. recession is it's still not quite time yet. Is that correct? Yeah. So, I'm, I mean, I think the one thing to – something that we think about a lot and um, a mental model we use, this idea of insiders versus outsiders. So – because we're sat here day to day looking at the data, looking at the models, there's a tendency to obviously get very tied up into the specifics. And sometimes it's helpful to just take a step back and say, you know, if an alien dropped in from Mars and looked at all the data, what would he think? So I think very much this idea of the long in the tooth, the fact that these structural indicators show we're late cycle is an outsider perspective. It's just important to be aware that and on the balance of probability, which way we want to be looking. But then you want to get into the nitty gritty of looking at leading indicators. And so in particular, Obviously, in, you know, after the U.S. election last year, you had a lot of the survey data, you know, surge, you had your curve steepen. So you had a lot of um, positive data, and that's basically uh, responsible for this uptick we see our indicator here. So, you know, that's telling us that despite late cycle, this, it's not quite there, and you kind of need to keep dancing whilst the cycle's turning up while the short-term cycle is turning up. However, because the outsider model also warns us that we're closer to the next recession than the last, it's very important to focus in now on the recession risks. And so this is why I've kind of devoted a separate chart, separate slide here on the slide six to U.S. recession. Because I think, you know, right now, even though markets are making all-time highs and, you know, people seem somewhat comfortable, this is definitely the number one macro risk to watch out for as we go into the second half of the year. Because I think, you know, there's a general misconception about how people think about re re uh, recessions. Typically, you see a lot of these charts where people will plot, say, industrial production or, you know, retail sales, and then they'll plot it over the last 50 years and say, hey, you know, every time this has turned negative, there's previous being a recession. Look, it's turned negative now. Therefore, you know, there's a recession. To us, recession doesn't really work like that. It's not a continuous process where, you know, we very smoothly go from slowing down to recession and go back. To us, it's kind of like a phase shift. So it's like a jump process in a way. So when we build our models to look at a U.S. recession, we're really trying to detect this idea of a phase shift. So when we build our models, we use, for example, Markov switching models. But really the key idea is that with a phase shift, things can change very quickly. And so it's important to watch, watch the data closely. I would make the argument, as we discussed at the very beginning, that post the great financial crisis, liquidity is more important than ever. And you are saying here in your next slide that the U.S. credit cycle has definitely rolled over. I notice that you're not saying that may be coming. That's uh, an already happened. So what does that tell us about this whole story? Almost all indicators we look at that track the U.S. credit cycle show us we're very, very late in the cycle. If you look at Fed loan surveys, if you look at the real growth of U.S. total bank assets, these are all slowing down dramatically. And this is obviously a huge concern because the Fed has started to raise rates. You know, in a typical credit cycle, behavior tends to change as the cycle matures. So obviously, later on in the cycle, you've had a lot of inverted balance sheets, a lot of bad balance sheet structures embedded in the economy so that 
as rates start going up and as banks don't want to lend anymore, suddenly people's mindset shift. It, your loan office is no longer thinking about keeping money from the loans. People start to worry about return of principal. And so when we see evidence of asset growth slowing, when we see evidence that lending standards are tightening, that's what really worries us because that's typically when you, when you get that shift in mindset, it's very hard for that to turn around. And so to us, it's very clear that in terms of credit cycle, people are moving towards a return of capital and capital preservation mindset, which makes us a lot more vulnerable today than we've been um, at any point in the last five or six years. In terms of global liquidity, which I think we agree is very important, tell us a little bit about what metrics you use. How do you measure the available liquidity and what are your indicators telling you? Uh, yeah, sure. So I think we cover this um, on slide eight. To us, there's obviously a lot of definitions of liquidity, but what we found that consistently actually lead risk asset prices is what we call global excess liquidity. Now, this is typically, we define as narrow real money growth minus economic growth. As I mentioned earlier, this is the idea that when uh, central banks went to moving average, and then it reversed dramatically on Wednesday before any inventory information came out. Normally, crude oil inventory comes out Wednesday morning. It was delayed this week by a day because of the holiday. So it seems like before we had any inventory information, we were already seeing a reversal and uh, this bounce in prices didn't make it all the way back to 49 or 50 as some people thought it would. It got as far as its 50-day moving average and rolled back over. Then came inventory. Holy cow. First API on Wednesday afternoon, then DOE on Thursday morning. Crude oil, 6.3 million barrel epic drawdown on inventories and obviously a very bullish signal for the crude oil market. Cushing, uh, Oklahoma, 1.3 million barrel drawdown. Gasoline, 3.6 million barrel drawdown. Distillates, 1.9 million barrel drawdown. So huge, huge drawdowns across the board. That, of course, sent crude oil prices just rocketing higher to the upside for all of about an hour or so. And, you know, it didn't last so far. I don't actually know if there was a specific proximal catalyst at 120 this afternoon on Tuesday, which is when the selling really took off. But we've already retraced all of the gains that came out. So if you've got that kind of bullish inventory report and you can't even get to the end of the day without, uh, you know, exhausting it and reversing back to the downside, it really speaks to the weakness of the market overall. In the past, I might have been tempted to write off the big draw down to whether in, say, Tropical Storm Cindy might have delayed the arrival of some imports into Houston that might have been responsible for an artificially large drawdown. That uh, analysis has gotten more complex as the U.S. has gone to both importing and exporting crude oil products. The guy who's really on top of this is Sam Madani. So Sam's going to join us after the feature interview, and we'll go into more depth on exactly what the impacts of weather are and how they may have affected the inventory today. The big question, though, is will those across-the-board drawdowns revive the rally in crude oil prices? And boy, it sure does not look that way as of Thursday afternoon. It looks like we're headed down, and I think that we're probably headed to new lower lows. I want to ask Sam his view about the biggest news of all, though, which is what I see is OPEC and Saudi Arabia have been silent for almost a month now, which is totally out of character. So what the heck is going on? Does it have something to do with Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, taking more power? power in the royal family. I'm not sure. Sam follows this stuff super closely, so stay tuned for extended coverage of crude oil after the feature interview is over. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to that interview with Sam as well. So let's uh, move on, though, to gold. And uh, it, it seems like almost all commodities are sluggish here. Just the way the distribution's happening in oil, it's like gold can't seem to catch an uptick and make it stick. We're right now trading around that 1224 level on gold. What are you thinking here? Well, I said last week, Patrick, that you should watch for a breakdown below the 200-day moving average, which at the time was around 1240. And if that happened, you could see an acceleration to the downside. Of course, that's exactly what happened uh, at the end of last week, beginning of this week. We saw a very rapid sell-off all the way down to a low print so far of 1216 spot 50. That was yesterday on Wednesday. Uh, so far, that's been the low print. I noticed uh, Nicola Duke had a tweet out with a little video suggesting a 
counter trend bullish trade there that she thought it had exhausted itself and was likely to bounce. I agree on a counter trend move that it was a little bit oversold there and due for a bounce, but it's a counter trend move. I think that there's still more downside in gold from here. It's a question of how much more. So I wouldn't be long unless it, I was a day trader and uh, inclined to pursue that probably short lived bounce. I think eventually it will exhaust itself and we'll see more downside. Well, you know, what I really want to move on to now here and talk about is these uh, treasury bonds. Like what a flip-flop from one week to the next. We find ourselves uh, down at some really nice low lows on the yields. Uh, and suddenly, just in a week, we find ourselves trading uh, almost at the 240 level on the 10-year uh, treasury yields. What are you thinking here? Yeah, you know, there was a critical support level in yields at around two spot 12, and we touched it one day, and I think that was two or three weeks ago. And I said in that show, yeah, we're having a little bounce off of that. Well, guess what? It's not a bounce anymore. This is much bigger than that. Caught me by surprise. We're still trying to get Jeff Gundlach on the program from Double Line. He very politely declined our invitation, but it sounds like we may be able to get someone else from the Double Line team on the program to comment on this, because they've certainly been extremely prescient in their calls on this treasury market. Uh, we're back to two spot 40. I haven't talked to Juliet de Klerk this week. I don't know whether she's still recommending that people stay long or not, but the move back up to 240 is much bigger than I expected. I thought we were going to bounce around in the in the teens and maybe hit the low two spot 20s, and then we were going to move to lower yields from there. Hasn't gone that way, so I'm adjusting my thinking. I'd uh, definitely want to ask Tian about this, but I really hope that we can get someone from Double Line on the program. This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 70 was recorded on July 6th, 2017. I'm Eric Townsend. Tian Yang will be joining me as this week's future interview guest. Tian heads up the research department at Variant Perception. Regular listeners may remember my interview with Variant Perception's founder, Jonathan Tepper, back in March. Tian will be bringing us up to date on Variant's market views and explaining why they don't think that it's time to be short equity markets yet, but they definitely see things starting to roll over. You're definitely going to want to download the chart book that Tian sent us. Registered users will find the download link in your Research Roundup email, and if you haven't registered yet, you can find instructions on how to register and get the download next to Tian's picture on our homepage at macrovoices.com. But Wait, there's more. After the feature interview, we're going to bring you a second guest to continue our expanded coverage of the crude oil market. Samir Madani is the founder of Hashtag OOTT and TankerTrackers.com. Sam and I will discuss the crude oil market, including today's massive drawdown in crude oil inventory levels and the interesting responses that we've seen in terms of market action, which has been a real roller coaster today on Thursday. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, that S&P 500 has now spent the entire week in a distribution cycle. Not only have we seen heightened volatility last week with these big, massive 30-point swings higher and lower in the S&P, but th today we're f seeing uh, the market just kind of almost bleeding out. Uh, we're right now trading around the 2413 at the time of recording. What's your thinking on the S&P 500? Well, we're still above the 50-day moving average at 24.11, but just barely above it by a couple of ticks, and we've tested it a couple times today. I think that the market is finding a little bit of support there. It doesn't look like it's going to hold, and I would predict that if we break below 24.10, it'll probably accelerate to the downside. Now, the question is, is this just a little blip? Is this just a, a little buy-the-dip opportunity, or has the tide actually changed? As you know, and as I've said many times in this program, this market it is way above its proper value in terms of any fundamental measure. But proper valuation is not what's important. What's important is the market can continue to get more and more overvalued until liquidity dries up, until there's no source of more buyers to keep overpaying too much for those S&P shares. Are we there yet? Tian is going to have a lot more to say on it because Variant does a huge amount of work with global liquidity analysis. Uh, so we'll get to that in the feature interview. Seasonally speaking, still a little bit early for, you know, 
know, you would you would expect if we were going to have a really big crash this year that we would see the highs in August and things would start to really get shaky in September and then uh, October would be when all the big action is. Certainly doesn't have to go that way. Could happen early. Maybe it's starting early. I'm not sure, but uh, certainly looks like we're seeing more weakness in the tape as we look at uh, what's happening. I'm happy to be on the sidelines. I don't think it's quite time to get short yet, but that's going to be the next trade for me is look for the opportunity when it is time to short this market. I don't think that the, the long side makes any more sense. Well, you know, at least on a technical basis, that 2415 to 2420 area was kind of the bottom end range of almost all the major consolidations. The fact that we're a few points below there already is just showing the general weakness of this price action. Maybe that uh, gun lack scenario of weakness in the, like a correction in the summer market here is, is plausible in this environment. Nonetheless, uh, let's talk about that dollar index because uh, the euro just o- overnight took off onto the upside again and, and the U- US dollar index just rolls over, rolled over and we're now trading in that kind of 95.50 level as it's uh, trading right now at about three o'clock on Thursday. Now, uh, what's your thinking on the dollar index here? Well, we had a nice little bounce all the way up to 96 and change, and we're back to a 95 handle now. So definitely, I, I do have a secular bull view for the U.S. dollar. It ain't happening right now. It's uh, This tape looks pretty ugly. Question is, how much more downside is there? I don't really have a technical target. I have kind of a gut feeling that 92, which was an important technical level about a year ago, might be where we, we find a bottom here, but I, I really don't have a strong opinion. I want to ask Tian about that. I think it really is going going to be uh, interesting to see what happens in Europe. I think it is the Euro story that's driving this, and uh, we'll find out in <laughs> what the market tells us. I don't really have a target for where it's going to bottom. Now, I'd really love to hear from you on what's going on with crude oil. Like uh, We had some in these inventory numbers coming out, and it just seems like uh, uh, oil just can't get any traction here. Well, exactly as we predicted last week, there was a rally which continued right up to the 50-day. Commercial banks and the entire financial system is creating extra money. It goes to, contributes towards growth and inflation. And then whatever is left will tend to flow into asset prices. So this is what we call excess liquidity. Obviously, when this is rising, there will tend to be a sea of liquidity that will tend to flow into the market by the dip and act as a support. But when excess liquidity is falling, um, obviously, you don't have that safety net there. So... I think to us, the key analogy is that when excess liquidity is good, there's a safety net to the market. But today, excess liquidity is actually falling. So we no longer have a safety net. This doesn't mean, obviously, the market will sell off tomorrow, but it certainly means as a whole, risk assets are a lot more vulnerable to drawdowns, which is why I think in an environment where excess liquidity is falling, it makes a lot more sense to raise some cash level and to um, actually spend some premium on tail hedges, because in that when we're into this lowering liquidity environment, a lot of those, you know, five to one, ten to one payoff type trades that they've, obviously they're five and five to one, ten to one for a reason, right? Because they're very low probability. But in this kind of environment, it suddenly starts making a lot more sense. So today, I think that's really something we're, we're watching very closely: the fact that global excess liquidity um, is falling. I think an analogy that we almost tend to overuse, but I think is, is super appropriate, is this idea of if you're trying to balance a ruler on your finger, fingertips, and the ruler falls off, why does it fall off? It could be because the wind blew or somebody bumped into you, but those tend to be proximate causes. The fundamental cause was that it was unstable to start with because you're trying to balance ruler on on your fingertips. And so to us, when global excess liquidity is falling, we're very much into a fundamentally unstable um, state of the market. So now suddenly it makes a lot more sense to pay attention to tail hedges to have a lot more of these um, bearish, uh, bearish risk asset trades. We've seen some interesting sudden moves in markets in the last several weeks. A few weeks ago, tech stocks sold off very suddenly and with no apparent proximal catalyst or trigger. There have been a a few very sudden moves in the S&P. Do you think that those are early warnings of, you know, something being wrong with the available market liquidity? Or is that just a coincidence and those are, I mean, on a percentage basis, that tech stock, stock sell off was nothing. But if you look at how quickly it happened and how it happened with no apparent news event as a catalyst, it made me kind of wonder, is is liquidity drying up in the markets? Is there a connection there? We certainly think so. And obviously, it's not just that. For example, you had the Brazil sell-off as well a few weeks back. So I think a lot of these are signs that when people run for the door, the liquidity they expect to is not necessarily there. And so I think a lot of these signs are early warning signs that we need to pay attention. Now, clearly, given what I said earlier about the fact that short term, the US LEIs are still at a high level, that, that doesn't mean obviously go out and short everything. But it certainly means that in, in, in terms of context, you want to start reducing your beta exposure, raising some cash levels, adding on some of these tail hedges. 
And tell us how China fits into the story as you guys see it. So China's been an interesting one. We actually um, were cyclically very bullish on China throughout 2016, back when the market consensus was clearly that China was actually going to blow up. So, you know, I had a very memorable trip at the beginning of 2016 where we saw, you know, 20 odd clients. And I just remember everybody was short RMB at that point, you know, even guys who weren't necessarily macro guys who, you know, used to be value guys. And so what was interesting was at that moment of peak pessimism, our China leading indicator the indicator had um, actually turned up very, very strongly. So both our China growth and China liquidity leading indicators turned up very strongly at that point. So throughout 2016, we were actually um, uh, very bullish. Now, today, we've almost started having the opposite effect, where the market consensus has gone towards, you know, China, China values there. You know, obviously, you've got the MSCI inclusion. Obviously, you've got RMB strengthening at the moment. So the sentiment's a bit better. There's some inflows into China. But today, our China growth lead indicator is actually topping, whilst our China liquidity indicator is actually fallen uh, quite dramatically. So we kind of almost have the mirror image of what we had back then. If you look on slide nine here, the, the bottom left-hand chart here shows our China physical activity indicator. So this is basically uh, a proxy using things like, you know, cement, steel production, um, auto sales, building completions, and so forth. So you can see, you know, after that surge, things have actually started slowing down a bit. But what's really the kicker here is if you look at the top right-hand chart, liquidity is really falling in China, in particular liquidity that used to be provided by the shadow banking system. So to us, these are some major warning signs, and we're actually very proactively pushing short China trades and to take advantage of the current kind of um, benign market view towards China, because if you look at you know, the likes of implied volatility on CNH, you know, it's never really been as cheap as this in the past year or two. So this is actually very, very attractive levels to start adding short China exposure. And indeed, you can see that even inside China, there's, the authorities are probably starting to get a bit more worried. The right-hand chart here is quite interesting. It shows the different house price indices that used to track house prices in China. What's really interesting is the black line here is the Sofong Index actually stopped being published at the beginning of this year. So apparently they voluntarily discontinued publishing it for the benefit of the Chinese economy. And so it, when you see things like this, it shows you that you know, people get nervous about the data coming out of China. And so when people are nervous, sometimes they just stop publishing it. But even though they stop publishing it, there's, 